Hi, uh, how is everybody today doing? Good, good. Um, so I'm going to talk about how to optimize low traffic sites. And as during the party yesterday, everybody seemed to be really concerned about it because we're always talking about CRO and we're always talking about A-B testing, but not all of us have enough traffic to do it. So who here thinks you don't have enough traffic to do a lot of A-B testing? Who cannot run multiple A-B tests a month? Yeah, so that's exactly what I'm talking about. And I'm going to build out five building blocks for you to build your own optimization plan. Um, so I want to start off with a concept that I read uh, from a book earlier this year, um, Thinking Fast and Slow. And the concept is, what you see is all there is. And this is human nature that um, we look into data, we analyze it, and we neglect everything that we don't know. So, and it's very crucial when we talk about optimizing low traffic sites, because low traffic means that we have little data. We have little data to draw our executive conclusions on. So it leads us to two problems. One of the problems is that we make happily false conclusions based on incomplete data, based on little data that we have available. So we run an A-B test, we come to a result, we think that that is an important result, we think that that is statistically significant, and we make a change on our website based on that. And the second is that it's in human nature to be overconfident about whatever we're doing. We think we're the best, we think we know everything, and we fail to neglect information that we don't know already. So how do we avoid making bad decisions for our business if we don't, if we don't have enough information to analyze? So there are two simple rules in A-B testing. One of them is that you have to look that your A-B test is statistically significant. The second is that the sample size has to be representative of the overall population. And now, probably, there are several tools out there that you can use to do this, and it seems rather easy. So, okay, if I follow these two rules, I will be clearer when doing optimization for my site. But let's look at a sample. So this is Optimizely Sample Size Calculator, and imagine that you have a conversion rate of 2%, and you're looking to run a test that will bring you an uplift of 5%. So that's the number of, how can I click? Yeah. So that there is the number of unique visitors you need per variation, which means that on that specific page, you need more than 700,000 unique visitors. And that is probably unreachable for most of you. So you might end up in this dark horror movie thinking that I don't have enough traffic, I cannot run one single A-B test a month, and I cannot do anything to improve my conversion rate. So what it is that we're doing here, maybe we should go off to lunch and, and just kind of implement the stuff that we know that works, and there's not much we can do to improve our conversion rate. But the truth is that A-B testing is only part of optimization. Optimization in itself is people-driven. It's not only data-driven. And as Pep was talking earlier, we don't want to be those data guys that we collect all this information, we have it, but we cannot use it anywhere. So you need to bear in mind that there are still things that you can do in order to improve your conversion rate. And that, that kind of leads us to the five building blocks that I'm going to go through. And you can think of it as a tower. So if you don't have the fundamental, you cannot build the ground floor. If you don't have the ground floor, you cannot go up and build the second floor. So there are these four layers here that you need to do before you can start any A-B testing at all. And I'm going to go through them one by one. And that's something that you should do when you go back to your office and you have a low traffic site and you want to build up your optimization plan. So the first one here, the slide is a bit <laughs> out of order, but the first one here is that you need to measure everything. This is what forms the fundamentals of your A-B testing plan. Um, you don't have the time afterwards to start gathering data. If you have a question about which of the tabs on the product page converts best, then you want to have that information available for you. So you can just go into analytics and look it up. So this is what forms the foundation of your A-B testing plan. This is what you should look out for. And there are several tools out there that you can use. You can use Google Analytics. You can use Heap Analytics uh, to build out specific sales funnels. You can also use Hotjar uh, for heat maps, session replays, and so forth. So you need to make sure that those tools are already installed and that you have validated the conversions behind, that you check it with your backend so you know that the measurement is set up properly. So this is the first thing you should do Monday morning 8 a.m. when you go to the office. You have to make sure that this is 
this is properly set up. The second building point is that you can, what you can do is that you can pick the low-hanging fruit. Um, web, websites have been there long enough, and there are certain standards that people look out for. Um, so people are used to finding certain types of information in certain places of a website. So if we think of an example here, um, then it's the Jacob's Law of Web User Experience that users spend most of their time on other websites. So your site is not going to be where they're learning where you're putting the information on. They know already where they should search this information. They're doing comparative shop shopping. So if we imagine e-commerce um, headers, it's always the same case. The shopping cart is in the upper right-hand corner. You have, the, you have the help in the upper left-hand corner, customer support. In e-commerce, you always have the search bar made very visible that will allow people to go and find the category that they're looking for. So this is, this is what you start off with. You start off by picking those low-hanging fruit and seeing what you can do in order to improve your conversion rate. So the same is with SaaS businesses. Um, they always have the demo in the upper right-hand corner. And even the main navigation, they contain the same information. So you have solutions, applications, products. And then you have customer service, why workday. So essentially, they're introducing what they're doing and why you should buy for them. And that's the first two tabs. So now if you're looking for a SaaS business, probably you're looking for that type of information there. So don't try to scare people away with your new innovative site. Don't do something that they, they're not used to. They cannot find the information. You're not Coca-Cola that you can change the color of Santa Claus. You're a kind of small website, and you need to go with the industry standards. Um, but one of the things also Pep talked about is that we shouldn't copy our competitors. We shouldn't mirror them. They don't know what they're doing about, about their website either. So it's, it's very crucial that you co go carefully about this, that you look for only those things that are the same everywhere. If you put the shopping cart, let's say, in the footer, people are not going to find it. It's, it's just lo not logical. So compare your site to the industry standards. And you need to also bear in mind that there are no silver bullets. Even in the same industry, you don't have an average target audience. You need to do your research to find out what are the qualitative insights that separate you from the rest. What is that makes that your customers think tick, and what makes them buy from you instead of competitors. So this leads us to the third building block. And this is essentially the most important one. This is what builds up your ground floor and your first floor, the one that kind of lays the foundation of your optimization tower. So what you should do is that think of the model Research Excel. Pep already introduced it. It's the one that we use at Conversion Excel. And we do it for every single client. And it may seem complex, but if you have low traffic, you have, let's say, 50 conversions a month, 100 conversions a month, you cannot really do A-B testing, but you can still learn about your customers. And those three, uh, heuristic analysis, user testing, and qualitative surveys, don't really require you to have a lot of conversions a month. So you can start off by doing heuristic analysis, evaluating your site uh, for what are the friction points. Am I showing my customers the right information at the right stage of the sales funnel? Do I have relevant content? Am I giving them motivation to buy from me? So there's nothing compared to human-led evaluation. And essentially what you're doing is that you're asking what's wrong with the picture. Am I, am I giving my customers the right directional cues and the reasons they should buy from me? Um, then the second thing that you can always do is user testing. Uh, you don't need to have any conversions to do this. You need, just need to define your target audience and hire people who match as closely as possible your target audience and who have not seen your site before. Then what you do is that you build out a specific scenario for them to go through what you would expect your average visitor to go through. Um, so let's say you're an e-commerce store, then you want them to find a specific product from a category page, a very specific product, specific size, color, because people have specific needs. You want them to sign up for the newsletter. And it's, it's usually the case that from 10 user tests to 20 user tests, you find out a lot of the usability problems. You find out where your customers get stuck. And those are things that you don't need to test. Those are things that you need to fix on your site, because you don't have the conversions to do testing anyway. So it's, it's kind of an example here um, where it's a website. It's what Oli talked about yesterday, about the attention ratio. 
And on this website, you have so many different things you can do. You have so many call to actions. You have the categories visible immediately. You have the what's new, shopping cart, and, it, and everything like that. And for their business, um, newsletter subscriptions make up a lot of the money. Because those people are the ones that, uh, they're selling guilting fabrics. So guilters, they want to know about the new fabrics out there. And they usually buy after receiving the newsletter. So eight out of 10 user, user testers who were told to subscribe for the newsletter couldn't even find it, even though it's in the header. So it's clearly a problem with the visual hierarchy of not even telling what, what they are subscribing to. You're just saying subscribe, but subscribe to what? So it has to be much more clear. Um, also, what you can do is that you can do qualitative surveys. You have to have some clients who have bought from you to do this or who have signed up with you. And it's best if those clients are the ones who bought from you recently. So their experience on the site is still fresh. And they know what they're talking about. They remember the frustrations that they had when they went through the website. So you want to ask them what made, makes them tick. What are the reasons that they're actually buying from you, not from anyone else? And what are the reasons that um, they were almost stopping the purchasing process? Maybe they also went to see a, check out the competitor site. So those, those people, they're pretty much what they're doing is that they're wording your value proposition for you. You have to listen to the voice of your customer. And you don't have to word your value proposition yourself. Um, Beb also showed the example of national allergy. Um, but I'm going to show it in a bit different um, light. So here they have a very good value proposition. And value proposition in itself, it's not only one sentence. It consists of five different parts. You have to have the headline. It has to grab attention and show the customers the end benefit that they're getting. You need to have a subheadline, the one over there, um, that brings more clarity into what the product is about, what is the site offering you. You need to have benefits. It's very good if the benefits are factual, that they're, here they're 100% money back guarantee. Everybody understands what it means. The number of customers they have served, because social proof is really important when it comes to buying allergy products. And also free shipping. So free shipping is also a benefit that everybody understands that it matters to the customers. And finally, you also have the visual that supports the overall value proposition. So it's a very good setup, and it's, it's done in the words of the customers. It's not worded by the executive board. So this, um, this is part of the qualitative research that you should do. And it's very important to remember, I, in the beginning, I introduced the tower. And um, you don't have enough traffic to do A-B testing. And this is something you can do without doing A-B testing. You have to find those crucial insights, those usability problems that you can fix straight away. And with quantitative research, it becomes a bit more complex, because now we're talking about data. And you might say, well, we don't have this data. But since the first day you do Monday morning is that you start measuring everything, then you start doing the qualitative research, you finish with that, let's say, a month from now, then by that time, you already have some information in your analytics that you can analyze. You have some heap analytics data, some clicks that you can look at what converts how well. So by now, you can do also some quantitative research to see where the problems are. And this doesn't really help you if you don't do the qualitative before. Those two, they have to go hand in hand. So these are the three different parts um, of the research Excel model that focus more on quantitative data. You can do uh, heat map analysis, you can do analytics analysis, you can also uh, do technical analysis. And that is very useful, useful when it comes to narrowing down where my website is experiencing problems, where my website is leaking money. So here's an example that is actually the other way around. You see that the average conversion rate is 2.8%, but Internet Explorer converts at 4. Um, this, is, this is an interesting example because you have two two ways you can learn from it. One is that all the other browsers are converting bad because something's wrong with them. The second, you can think that it's a peculiar um, thing with my target audience, that this company, they're offering something that most people are buying from Internet Explorer. And actually, it's the same guilting company. So their average target audience are female, 50 to 60, and they're, they're having old computers at home. So they use Internet Explorer. Um, but here you have a different, uh, different graph you can pull out from Google Analytics, and it's conversions per mobile device. And nowadays, mobile usage of websites is very, it's growing, it's a very important part of the business. And what you can look at, again, is that you compare the average conversion rate to the different mobile device conversion rates. 
And if you see a difference, like here, that you have 3.36 average conversion rate, and one of the mobile phones is converting at 1.03, then probably you have a, some sort of problem there. Probably you should pick up that device. But it's also very crucial that the segment is big enough. Now, if you have, for example, two visitors who bounced from this specific, like who went to the website with this device and bounced, then that doesn't matter. Then you shouldn't look at it. You should, you should still look at how many people are showing this average conversion rate to you. So if you have more than 1,000, that's very, that's very good. Then you can take it as a reliable insight, and you should probably start fixing your website with that device. Um, you can also do analytics analysis. And, and this is the second part of the quantitative data research that you can do. Uh, from analytics, you can learn a lot of valuable insight. Now imagine that you have an e-commerce store. And you see from analytics that people who search for a specific product or a category, they convert three times better than those who don't. And now if you look at your website, the search is nowhere visible. So that's a learning that you should do immediately. You should make the search visible because you still don't have that traffic to start testing. We're still talking about being very low traffic websites. So it's more about the innovative testing and taking the risk and, and put it live and then measuring what your conversion rate is doing. So this is, this is something you should do. And also analytics analysis, it allows you to look at um, the sales funnels. So here's a sales funnel where people go from product page to cart to checkout. And in the checkout stage, 88% people abandon the purchasing process. Those are people who have selected your products, spent five minutes on the site, selecting the products, deciding on the cart they want to buy. They have clicked on pay now, so basically they have even agreed for the money, and now they're leaving your web page. So there's something radically wrong there. You should check your checkout for credibility, for trust issues, and now you have done the qualitative research before, then it starts to tie in. If people tell you that they don't trust the site, then probably there's an issue there. So you have to kind of, when you're doing the quantitative, you get to know where the, where the problems are, and the qualitative tells you the why. So combining the two will give you insight that you can actually implement on the site. And also a very powerful tool. Um, it's um, mouse tracking analysis and heat maps in general, because they will tell you where on the page people are clicking, what areas are they missing, because usually when you read a text, you also hover over it. So it's a very valuable insight, which you get from um, Hotjar. That's the one that we use for it, at least. And there's a line. The line here it represents the above the fold area. And it's a product for um, inflatables. So they say, sell inflatable bounce houses, water parks, and so forth. And here from this heat map, what we see that is that the last tab below the fold gets the most clicks. So it's a very, very significant insight. And when you look into what is that tab, you find out that it's specs. Now, from qualitative research, what we found out is that people say that they want to know the measurements of the products. And that is, that is kind of, you have the qualitative, you have the quantitative part. People are telling you what they want to know. You're not showing it to them, so fix it straight away. That's not something you need to test. The insight there is strong enough. Um, now, let's say you have done all those. You have collected the low-hanging fruit. You have done the measurement is set up properly. You have done the qualitative research, and you have done the quantitative as well. You have implemented every single thing on which you got enough proof on. And now you're already approximately at 500 conversions a month. Why 500? Because that's the minimum for you to run at least one A-B test a month. You need 250 per variation, but that's a ballpark number. It's not really that straightforward. So you should start thinking about A-B testing. You should start educating your company about A-B testing, letting them know um, how it goes, getting them excited about it. And I'm going to bring out five different things you need to look at when you're A-B test with low traffic. Because even if you start testing now, it doesn't mean that you always reach statistical significance or a sample size. So there are still problems that, that you will see. And the first thing is that you need to prioritize your hypothesis. And, and Pep was talking about it before, but there's a thing with low traffic site that you need to consider is that implementation cost for you matters less than up potential for uplift. This is due to the reason that you need to only test high impact changes. And if you remember the optimizedly sample size calculator that I showed you before, um, it has the sample size requirement of more than 700,000 unique visitors. 
but that's a, for a conversion rate uplift of 5%. Now imagine you have the same e-commerce store, you have 2% uh, conversion rate, but you now want to have 10% uplift with your, uh, with your A-B test. Now the sample size requirement is by far much less. It's um, around 150,000 unique visitors. Still not good, but now if you increase it to 15%, you get uh, 30, sorry, you get 64,000 unique visitors per page. And if you manage to get it to 20%, then the unique visitors goes really down even more. So you need to make more riskier decisions. You need to test things that will be of high impact, because that's the only way you will actually reach statistical significance. And um, there's an easy way to how to evaluate this, is that you will, you will have to ask yourself, will everybody coming to the page notice the treatment? Will everybody be influenced by it? Does it directly influence my customer's user behavior? And, and here's a sample for, um, for the same inflatable company. And their header, first it's home inflatable commercial. And what we did is that we opened up the home inflatable category entirely. We found out from analytics that commercial, it doesn't sell from this page. It wasn't really relevant for them either. And people were struggling because they didn't know what type of product categories they even have. And this is radically changing the navigation of the page. Everybody who comes there notice that, notices that there's a difference. The second example I want to bring out is that here, only the small headline or subheadline beneath the search was changed. So you have different categories here. And this is something that not everybody is going to see. So this is something you cannot test on a small traffic site. It's only going to influence for those people who are doing search or who are interested by those categories. The, so this is something you shouldn't do on a low traffic site rather than the previous one where you're radically changing the user behavior. Um, and the, the third one is, is kill the weaklings early. Um, that is something that you should, um, you should consider. And I know that Greg is going to object because he's going to talk about that you shouldn't look at your test too early and you shouldn't close them too early and, and it's not scientifically correct to do it that way. But now consider that you're, you're a low traffic site. You're going to run your test for two months anyway, because that's the only hope you have of reaching any statistical significance at all. So now two weeks in, you need to check your data and see that if you have some sort of conversion rate difference that is scary, if it's small, then it doesn't matter. But if it's something that it scares the hell out of you, you have the original with 60 pur purchases and you have variation one with 17, then you probably should consider closing this treatment and testing something else that may bring an up bigger potential uplift. So it's, it's always about opportunity cost. And if you're testing something for two months period, then opportunity cost gets also higher. Um, but you need to be careful. Um, don't kill your weakling too early. I, I have this often that I, I go, to, go to the office Monday morning. I have an email from a client saying that, hey, our test is losing by 50%. We should close it now. Or we've already put it on pause. And then when you actually look at the conversion counts, it's seven versus four. That doesn't really tell you anything. So wait at least two weeks' time and wait at least for the conversion difference to be, to be something that really scares you, that, to be something more significant, more like 60 to 20 or 80 to 20. Um, and, and finally, a question um, I get often is that now the two months period is over, we haven't reached statistical significance, but we have to make an executive decision. We have to close the treatment. We're not going to run any more A-B tests. So what are we going to do? We have run it for two months. We have all this data. We don't have any scientific proof that this is the right one. So you, what you can do is that you can look for additional proof. You can, um, you can first of all, you can see that has any of the micro goals also reached statistical significance. You have more conversions and micro, micro goals. And it also has to be logical. So this is just additional proof that you will get. This is not the one single proof that you have. And the second thing is that if the conversion rate has stayed stable throughout the whole testing period. Now again, it's not only two days that you see it's stable. It, it has been running for two months. And if in two, two months time, you always see that the line, it goes like this, your variation is above, the one is below. The difference may be 10% and you need to run it for six more months in order to reach statistical significance, then probably you should, and you have to make an executive decision, then this one is a good indication that you're in the right direction. Um, if those two come closer together, then in time, probably there's no difference. And, and 
finally, the one that you cannot see, <laughs> and it's actually good that you cannot see it, because um, it's, it's a question that, um, that I get asked often, is that, so what if we lower the statistical significance requirement? Wouldn't we then require a lower sample size? And now, if we look at the, the sample size calculator again, here we have the 95% statistical significance, and when we lower it to 80, it's not gonna help you much. So imagine, imagine you're driving a car, 100 kilometers an hour on a highway, and usually the speedometer, it lies about a couple of percentages, so that's a risk you're willing to take. And now if you would agree for the speedometer to lie 20%, that means that you never know if you're going 80 kilometers an hour or 120. And that's, that's in the end of the day, you're gonna get a fine someday, and that's your business. So you don't wanna take higher risks without having any gains from it. So on this slide, the last one is crossed out. So you shouldn't really focus on it. So to summarize, um, to build your own optimization plan, you need to build it from ground up. In order to do A-B testing, when you have reached a conversion rate level where you can do A-B testing, you have to make sure that your foundation is set up properly, that you have the measurements set in place, that you have done the qualitative research, you have done the quantitative research on top of that, pulled the insights together, and derived strong hypotheses from them. And it doesn't really make sense to test stuff that is, is obvious to you. Those are the things that you should just implement and you start testing about with things that bring you more questions. Thank you. All right. You run a test, but you don't have enough sample size, you know significance, test is now valid. Can you still pull insights out of that test? Um, well, it depends, on the, it depends on the hypothesis that you, you're testing in the first place. So if the hypothesis is something, it, it does tell you that there's no difference. So if it's something that's... Um, um, no, the, it, the question was that if you don't have enough samples, that meaning you don't know if there's no difference. Okay, so, well, that's a complicated, like, complicated question. If you don't have enough sample size, your test hasn't reached any statistical significance. What you can do is that you can look for the micro goals. If there's any additional proof that indicates the same direction, and if the difference has stayed stable throughout the whole period, the last two things that I was talking about. So those are the things that you can look out for. And if you don't see any additional proof from that, don't implement it. Just start testing something else. But if you see that there's strong evidence in micro goals that that might be true, then you may implement it and then really closely monitor what is going on with your conversion rate. Yes. What, would you, uh, what would be your top three pieces of advice for uh, running A-B tests on a B2B website where that has very little traffic and uh, volume of conversions is, a high volume of conversions is not possible? Three pieces of advice. Three pieces of advice. Well, um, if you, if you, if I, A-B testing is not possible, you should start off by, do, do user testing. Make sure that people who match your target audience understand what is your site about, and they understand what it is that you want them to do there. Um, you can also talk to your existing customers, see what they enjoyed about the site, what, it, what were the things they didn't like about it. So really, if, if it's really low traffic, then qualitative research is the one that you should turn to. Finding out the why and listening to your customers, listening to your customer voice, because that's the thing that makes a difference. Uh, last question. If you are a small company and have limited resources, why not just put all the energy in getting more traffic instead of optimization? Well, if you have, um, that's, that's always like a chicken and egg question. Which one should I do first? Is it build traffic or optimize for a better conversion rate? And those things, they should go hand in hand. Because if you build more traffic, then you will have a very high cost for your pay-per-click ads. So you should start doing those things at the same time. So what I would recommend is that once you have done the qualitative and quantitative, and you have implemented those low-hanging fruit that you find that are radically wrong on the page, then after that you should start building traffic and doing A-B testing at the same time. So that would be kind of the, the usual flow that you should go with. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Thank you.